planning. You wouldn't be here if you didn't plan that on Sabbath you want to go to church. There are plans for life, there are plans for house plans, there are plans for job, for wedding, for retirement. One of the characteristics of human race is that we are intentional. We want direction and meaning. And it happens better if we plan rather than act randomly. In the Asian world, there were two ways how to express what's going on in life and the plans. One was called comedy. Now you need to know that comedy is a Greek word and the Greek thinking influenced the people around the Mediterranean Sea. Now when you and I hear comedy, we think about something funny, something humorous. But comedy originally did not mean something funny or humorous. It just meant a story that has a good ending. And if a story has a good positive ending, then it's called comedy in Greek. Now, <clears throat> you might have heard that one of the most famous med medieval writings was written by Italian writer in 14th century, Dante Alighieri, and it's called The Divine Comedy. Now, there is nothing funny about it. Actually, most people only know about it because they read the description what happens in hell in that piece. But actually, it's a story of a soul progressing from where it is into the very presence of God. And because the soul ends with God's presence, it's comedy because it has a good ending. Now, we all have plans for our lives, and we all want our lives to be a comedy. So we want good, positive things. And often, even in evangelistic meetings, we present Christianity, you know, if you do the will of God, if you do this and don't do that, God will bless you. And if you listen to Jesus and follow him, then your life will be a comedy. It will be a good story and you will end up in, a, in God's kingdom. Now, in ancient Mediterranean world, there was another story, a story that had a bad ending, and that was called tragedy. Tragedy is when the story did not have a good ending. Remember the book of Job? Now, he was doing all the right things, yet his life is not a comedy. It's a tragedy. Now, Eventually, it had a good ending, but there was a miserable way of getting there. And so now you understand how the literary forms work in the ancient world. Most, most of us plan for our lives to be a comedy. We don't want tragedy in our lives, yet we all experience them. And the question is, what happens when life becomes a tragedy? No one plans on getting cancer at 25. No one plans that they are going to get married and then divorced, unless you are one of those most perverse human beings. No one plans that their job or their marriage or their life will be wrecked. No one plans on, for tragedies in life. We want our lives to be entirely a comedy, a positive life. We want good things to happen, and when bad things happen, we ask, where is God? It's not supposed to be like this. What is he doing? Now, if we were careful, or reading the Bible more carefully, we would discover that the Bible shows that they are both positive both positive and negative things happening in life. So you read about the life of David, and the Bible paints it warts and all 
everything is there. It's not only positive things, it's also negative things. Now, if you look at the Gospels, I want you to see this morning how the Jewish plan for the Messiah was that it will be a comedy. It will be a good plan. And actually, it turns out to be a tragedy. And the best way to see how the Gospels portray that is to look at Mary. And that's why the scripture reading that you have heard about the life of Mary. Now, Mary is about 13 to 15 years old. That's when the girls get married in those days. Remember, Joseph is a widower. His wife died. And the two families, the family of Joseph, although he was a married man, but still he cannot choose his own wife. The parents need to do this. And the parents of Mary meet, and they agree, and they sign the contract that as soon as Mary grows up, he is going to marry her. And so he is waiting for Mary to grow up. And then she's about 13, 14 years old, and she gets this visit from an angel. And uh, you read about it in uh, Luke 1. So if you turn to Luke 1, either in your Bible or the holy devices, In verse 20, 26, Luke 1, 26. In the sixth month, that is the pregnancy of Elizabeth, the mother of uh, John the Baptist and the wife of uh, Zechariah, God sent his angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, something like shalom, peace. Who you who are highly favored, the Lord is with you. Now Mary greatly was troubled and what, wondered what kind of greetings this might be. What do you mean? That I am highly favored with God and God is with me. But the angel said to her, Don't be afraid, Mary, because you found favor with God. You will be with child and give birth to a son. That's a 50-50% chance. Yeah. And you are going to give him a name Jesus. Now we say Jesus, they say Yeshua. It means God saves. The same name in the Old Testament is translated Joshua. Okay? God is the Savior. God is the one who saves. He will be great and he will be called the son of the Most High. The Lord will give him the throne of his father David and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever and his kingdom will never end. In other words, the story of Messiah is going to be a comedy. It's going to be a good story. And then, of course, Mary asks a question. How will this be? Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin. And the angel said, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. And so the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. And then he mentions even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age. Her life is a comedy, has a good ending. She was barren and now is in her six months of pregnancy, for nothing is impossible with God. And then comes the amazing thing. Mary realizes that, oh, but this means that I am going to have a child out of wedlock. Imagine 2,000 years ago what that means in a small town of Nazareth. Yet in verse 38 she says, I am the Lord's servant, 
Mary answered, may it be to me as you have said. Let's go with it. Let's go ahead. I am for it. Now that's amazing. This is a woman who says to God, let's roll. Bring it on. I want to be Messiah's mama. Now that's an amazing commitment for someone who is 13, 14 years old. And she knows what it means. But you and I don't. And if you want an insight into what it means, how the Jews understand what the Messiah is going to do, let's read what Flo already read for us from verse 46. Now, she's puzzled by that, and she suggests to her parents, may I go and visit Elizabeth? She has always been so nice. She treated me nicely, not like a little teenager, but always respected me. She comes to her home. And when she comes, Elizabeth says, blessed you are among the women, and blessed is the child you will bear. And she says, uh-oh, has the angel been here too? What's going on here? And then Mary said, my soul glorifies, that's why it's called Magnificat, this, because my soul magnifies the Lord. Why? Because he has been mindful of my humble state. So she's talking about her poverty, her financial and economic low status and a position. From now on, all generations will call me blessed, except for the Protestants, of course. And why? Because the mighty one, God, has done great things for me. Holy is his name. His mercy extends to those who fear him. So it's not only towards me. Notice the first part, she speaks about herself, what God did for her. And then she says his mercy extends from those from generation to generation. She turns her attention to others and says, he has performed mighty deeds with his arm. He has scattered those who are proud in their inmost thoughts. He has brought down rulers from their thrones, but he has lifted up the humble. He has filled the hungry with good things. He has sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel, remembered to be merciful to Abraham and his descendants forever, even as he said to our fathers. The story of Messiah is going to be a comedy. It's going to be a good story. Because when Messiah comes, then those who are on the thrones will be kicked down. And notice, she uses past tense, speaking about the future events. Now, remember who is sitting on the throne when she says this? Herod the Great. Now, remember Herod the Great. If you looked at him in the wrong way, he chopped his, your head off. Even his beloved wa wife, Mariana, he chopped her. The only woman who ever loved him. He killed her. Most of his sons, he killed them because he was afraid they are too pretentious for the throne. And as far as Mary is concerned, she has no sono, sonogram, no proof. But for her, Herod is gone and dead. And she is singing about God performing mighty deeds with his arms, scattering down those who are proud in their inmost thoughts, bringing down rulers, those sitting on the throne. When the Messiah comes... The proud will be humiliated, the poor will be blessed, and finally we will have the society as God always intended. This is a good story. This is a comedy. This is what is going to happen. So Mary says, when the Messiah comes, not only I will be his mom, but the poor will get what they deserve, the rich will be stripped from their wealth, and those who are oppressing will be no more there, and finally we will have justice. 
And everybody who heard the singing and everybody in the Jewish society said, Amen. Amen. That's how they read the Old Testament. That's how they understood what is going to happen when Messiah comes. That was the messianic plan according to their reading of the Bible. He will rule and reverse injustices and God's people will experience the great reversal. He's the son of David. That means finally we'll get back the kingdom that Nebuchadnezzar took away from us. And the kingdom will be eternal. He will be the savior. They will be the victory. If you turn the page into Luke 2, the angels are singing in verse t- Luke 2, verse 10. But the angel said to them, do not be afraid, I bring you good news of great joy. I bring you evangelion. Now, everybody in that society knows what it means. There are inscriptions, the birth of Caesar Augustus was the beginning of good news. Because the fact that the Caesar Augustus was born is the evangelion, is the gospel, and that joy Because he brought the Pax Romana, the peace. So all these words. Today the town of David, a savior has been born to you and he is Christ the Lord. He is the curious. Not Augustus, not Tiberius, not Nero, but Jesus is the Lord. So all these words are heavy, loaded with meaning for people who hear them. And of course, because these people live in that society, how do they imagine that the Messiah is going to achieve justice, fairness? Not the same way as Augustus and Nero and Tiberius did, with their sword, with their power, and making sure that the, those who are down are rewarded and those who are up are punished. In the Jewish plan, in their understanding, this was the best story ever told. This was the greatest comedy. They expected this to be a positive story with good ending. But as Flannery O'Connor, the great Southern fiction writer said, it just aren't right enough. It just does not happen like that in life. And this Jewish plan is going to be changed. And Jesus, when he comes, he shows that this greatest comedy is becoming the greatest tragedy. It's not going to happen like that. It's the tragedy that shapes the comedy. So, and that's something that you and I can relate because we know that A comedy is not a complete story of our life without problems and difficulties that come into our lives. So we know now what was the Jewish plan. We know how the people understood it. We know how Mary understood it, how she understood the words of the angels. Now let's see what was Jesus' plan, what was the Messiah's plan for the Messiah. So let's go to John 2. Back to the Gospel of John that we have referenced a number of times today. In John 2, the first story of the ministry of Jesus is the wedding in Cana in Galilee. And Jesus' mother is there and she is somehow related to the bridegroom and the bride. And then it says... Verse 3, when the wine was gone, Jesus' mother said to him, they have no more wine. And she is bothered by that because it's a social embarrassment. And so she comes to Jesus and says, they have no more wine. Now you need to know that she is not just informing him. She is not just relaying a piece of information. She is gently nudging him and saying, you are a big boy now. You are the Messiah, so do something. Make something happen. Do something about this situation. 
And now Jesus responds in verse 4. And the response is not something that you have expected from Mr. Messiah. Now, I don't know about you, but if I said that to my mother growing up in the 60s, I would not, uh, she would not be pleased or amused. Dear woman, and NIV softens it for you, dear woman, but he says, woman, why do you involve me? He says to her, my hour has not yet come. Why is this of concern to me and to you? Now, you can be sure that Mary is stunned. This is not something that she responded, that she expected. But she responded to the servants, do whatever he says. Just do whatever he says. And you know what he did? And Jesus said to the servants, verse 7, fill the jars with water. And so they filled them to the brim. Now we learn that they were six of them there. Do you know what's the container? That's 635 liters. That's 168 US gallons. 168 gallons of wine. And because wine is sold in 0 0.7 bottles, so that's 907 bottles of wine. Do you realize what's going on? It's like you have a son who is turning 18 and you order 400 pizzas for the birthday party. <laughs> Just for him. Okay? But Jesus shows that when the kingdom comes, there is an extravagance. There is a joy in the presence of Messiah. And that when the Messiah comes, it will be a joy that cannot be contained and it's overflowing. Now you who are without money, come and drink and be filled. This is the prophecy of Isaiah. When the Messiah comes, he will bring joy in abundance. And the, uh, the man in charge of the says, you did it differently than everybody else because you saved the best for the last. In this world, you start on a high when you are young, and then as the older you get, there is not much looking forward to, but in the kingdom of God, it's vice versa. There's always a future worth looking forward to. Now, you and I discuss what kind of wine Jesus just made. Yeah, sure, 907 bottle, bottles. Wow, what do you do with that? But that's not about it. Mary has to learn the lesson. If Jesus is the Messiah, she will have to follow him. He is not going to follow her. He is in charge. She is not. She is the mama of Messiah, but then the kingdom will come according to God's terms, not according to her terms and her understanding. And it won't be an easy way to learn for Mary. If you learn, if you go now to Mark, Mark 2, the first story in Mark 2, Jesus heals a paralytic. And then Jesus calls a tax collector to be his disciple. Someone who says, yeah, I can cheat on my own people and pay the taxes to Romans. You know, if I make some shekels, that's okay. Why not align yourself with the occupying force as long as I make some bucks in the process? Then the disciples of John come to Jesus and say, you... How come that your disciples are not fasting? And instead of saying, this is what pious Jew looks like, Jesus says, why would you need that? Why fasting? It's not going to make you recommendable to God. God is not going to love you more because you have empty stomach and all the funny noises. If they have the bridegroom, the bridegroom makes them acceptable, not the fasting. And then comes the, another problem. He starts meddling with uh, 
Sabbath and doing things that people think it's breaking of the Sabbath. And Mary knows this is not going in the right direction. Jesus is doing all the right things for the wrong people and getting all the right people upset with him. He healed the paralytic. He eats with tax collectors, with sinners, doing things the kosher Messiah should not be doing. He offends Pharisees. He offends the disciples of John. He starts tinkering with food laws and doing things on Sabbath that everybody thinks it's not appropriate. And it looks like he's working on Sabbath and they don't like it. And then it brings us to verse in chapter 3, you know, it brings us to verse 21. Jesus entered the house and the crowd gathered and he and his disciples were not even able to eat. Verse 21, when his family heard about this, they went to take charge of him for they said, he is out of his mind. Now I'm sure you have read this before but I assume your Bible was glued there because you didn't realize the meaning of this. Jesus' family, that means Mary and the children. Remember, according to Mark, Jesus had four brothers and at least two sisters. And by the way, this proves that these children are from Joseph's first marriage. Because Jesus is younger than them, they go after the young brother and say, he's out of his mind, the guy went crazy. He is bringing shame to our family. They could never do this if they were younger than Jesus, okay? They can do this because Jesus is the youngest in the family. They are all older than Jesus. In a patriarchal society, that's obvious. So these are the brothers, are the sons of Joseph from the first marriage. They are not through Mary, they are through the wife that died. But here is the thing. They come to take charge of Jesus because they say he is mad. The guy just went crazy. Why? Because Mary says, man, if you don't watch yourself, you are going to get yourself killed. This is supposed to be a comedy. But this is turning into a tragedy. And Jesus says, mother, watch me. I am going to be killed. But Mary knows what Messiah is supposed to be like. She heard it from the angels. She heard it from the prophets. She knows how the Jews are interpreting the prophecies. It means if he's going to be the Messiah, he needs to cobble favors with Pharisees and Sadducees and Herodians. But Jesus seems to be doing everything to upset the right people and to treat nicely the wrong people. How is he going to be the Messiah if he has no powerful friends? How is he going to be the Messiah if he offended everybody who was in charge? It's madness. And that's why Mary says, this comedy is heading towards a tragedy. So we need to do something. Now look what happens at the end of the chapter. Verse 31. Then Jesus' mother and brothers arrived. You see, Joseph is not mentioned anymore, so he's dead. By this time, Mary takes Joseph's children to Capernaum, to Peter's house. She knocks on the door, and she says, is Yeshua here? Is Jesus here? Tell him to come home. If he is not careful, he is going to get killed. And the people go to Jesus and say, by the way, excuse me, your mother is at the door. And Mr. Messiah, once again, does not respond in the most messianic way. He says, you tell Mary, my mother, you are welcome to come inside the room and you can sit in the circle with the rest of my disciples and be one of them. And then he adds, and he looked around and said, those seated in the circle around him and said, who is my mother and who are my brothers? Here are my mother. 
Here are my brothers. Whoever does God's will is my brother and sister and my mother. Now imagine Jesus is saying this. He's saying to Mary, yes, you are the mother of Messiah. Nobody will take away that from you. But if you are going here truly to be a follower of the Messiah, something needs to change. If you are going to follow me, then yes, you have to assume a proper posture. You have to sit at my feet and listen to me and learn from me and let my ministry define what a Messiah is. It's not supposed to be that you are going to determine what the Messiah does. Now you are ready to turn to Matthew 16. And in Matthew 16, verse 13, Jesus comes to the region of Caesarea Philippi. Jesus takes his disciples to a pilgrim place outside of the Jewish territory. And then Jesus asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? And Peter replied and confessed. And he said, you are the Messiah. Peter thinks... This is uh, rather cool. You are the Messiah. And Jesus said, Blessed you are, Simon, son of Jonah. It's not because you have discovered this. You have figured this out. This has been revealed to you from God. And now listen. Verse 21. From that time on. Now notice. We are six to nine months to the crucifixion. So three, almost three years of Jesus' ministry are gone. And when Jesus is six to nine months before his death, from that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of elders, chief priests, and teaching, teachers of the law, and that he must be killed, and on the third day he will be raised to life. Here we are, six to nine months before the end of his ministry, and now for the first time when the disciples say, oh, you are the Messiah, and everybody said amen and clap, Jesus says, actually, being a Messiah is not a comedy. It's a tragedy. And look, verse 22, Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. He says, Jesus, Yeshua, my friend, Messiahs don't die. Messiahs reign. Read your Bible. And Jesus says, follow me. Actually, in Greek, he says, follow after me. Follow after me and learn something. If he says, get away, as some translations have it, if Jesus says, get lost, there is no hope for anyone. Peter or us. But in Greek he says apagao, follow me. Just like he says to the rich young ruler or other people, follow me. Follow after me. Now, do you see what's going on? Not only God's kingdom come as a party with abundance of joy, Not only Jesus' behavior is one of scandalous solidarity with the wrong people and official opposition to the right people. Not only he says that everybody has to assume the right posture, that he is the Lord and everybody else are his disciples, his students, and learning from him. Now he explicitly says, I am going to die. And according to synoptics, has it ever happened to you that you heard something that you never heard? He's going to repeat it two more times, so that three times he says, and by the way, we are on the road to Jerusalem, so for the next six months, three times he's going to tell them, and it's not going to end well. Remember, when he died, his disciples go into deep depression because they say, and we have hope that he's the one who is going to redeem Israel, but now all is finished. All is 
came to a sad end. And his enemies say, by the way, can we get the soldiers to guard the tomb? Because this imposter, while he was alive, he said, we are going to Jerusalem, I am going to die, but then I am going to be resurrected. The disciples don't hear it. Because they are the Jews, they read their Bible through their glasses, you know, this is the greatest comedy. But the Romans who don't read the Bible, they say, this guy is going to come back to life and we have a problem on our hands. Let's send the group of soldiers to guard the tomb. So Jesus says, I am going to die. This is not a comedy. This is a tragedy. You don't understand God's plan with this world until you understand the tragedy. The tragedy is that human beings are corrupt and sinful. And God wants it to become a comedy, a good story. But the only way how it can become a good story is that somebody has to turn this to tragedy into a comedy and the only way to do it is to come and be part of the story and allow the evil to crush you. Now, you and I know this. We live in a world which is more tragedy than a comedy. People lose their jobs, people lose their children, people suffer through divorce, through financial breakdown, through loss of confidence, loyalty. They go through all different kinds of experiences that you and I go through in life. And the gospel is that God is entering into our tragedy and changes the story into a good story, into a comedy. Messiah entered into the deepest tragic dimensions of life in order to reverse the story. And then he died, and Mary is there, and the other Mary. And then, on Sunday morning, the other Mary goes to the tomb, and she sees that Jesus was resurrected, that the story was re reversed. And when... Jesus says to her, Mary, he calls him Rabuni, which in Aramaic means my teacher. She has assumed the right position, sitting at the feet of Jesus. She's her teacher. Remember Martha? Yeah. Remember Mary? If you want to be my mother, you have to sit at my feet. You have to be one of my followers to understand what I am bringing the story. Do you realize that the story of Mary doesn't end on the cross? If you turn to Acts 1, verses 12 to 14, there is a group of people, 120, and you discover they are the brothers of Jesus who now believe in him, and there is also a Mary. There is this group of people who believe that this fact that Jesus died is not the greatest tragedy. It's actually a good comedy. It's a turning of the story. The tragedy has been reversed because Jesus was resurrected. As they want to hang on to this story, knowing that God can transform even the worst situations with what he does. And so you come to verse 14, Acts 1:14. And they all joined together constantly in prayer along with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, with his brothers. And Mary is there. And now she is with the other disciples. And you know what happens? The Holy Spirit comes and people are blessed and God shows that if God has resurrected Jesus, that means he was not an imposter that God can turn a tragedy into a good story, into a comedy, that God is still at work. The Spirit of God comes and transforms this community. 
And if you turn to chapter 2, the result of that is in verses 42. And they devoted themselves to apostles' teaching and to the fellowship. They are together to the breaking of bread and prayer. And everyone was filled with awe and many wonders and miraculous signs were, do signs were done through the apostles. All believers were together and had everything in common, selling their possessions and goods and gave to one another according to the need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple. They broke bread and homes and ate together with gladness and sincere heart. They were praising God and enjoying the favor with all the people. This is back to... Eugene Pedersen translates, and people liked what they saw. Remember what we said in the Sabbath school? And people said, I don't understand what these guys are, but I like this. We have never experienced this sense of togetherness and community. And the privilege of blessing others was more important than the privilege of owning something. And Mary says, Mary is sitting there, and they had a baptism, and people said, I want to be part of this. And Mary is there, looking at all this, and she says, I remember when the angel said to me that my son one day would be a king. And I remember the song that I was singing, that one day there will be justice, and that someday the poor will be fed. And someday the rich will be stripped from the oppressing positions and they will care about people around them. I had no idea how this story will develop. I had no idea that the tragedy is going to turn into a comedy. That God is going to transform the world, not through the sword, not like Constantine and Nero and Caesars do it but in a very different way. I had no clue that God would do it through a small community that committed itself to live out the magnificent vision of Mary. And Mary sits there and says, I had no idea, but I like it. I do like it. So, that's the story of the Bible. It's a comedy the best comedy but it's part of the tragedy that you and I go through yes people do bad things that cannot be undone you have all experienced that in your own lives but God is concerned not only to what happened with what happened to you but God is concerned with you the problem with tragedies of life, especially when they are unjust, is when you are a victim of abuse, that the memory stays. Jack Provencia used to tell the story. An old prostitute got married, and another colleague meets her and says, so how it's going? And she said, it didn't last too many memories. The memories and the distorted pictures happen because of injustices of life. But God says, I am in the business of turning a tragedy into a community. God is putting things together in a new way so that memories can be healed. So that past events can be processed in such a way that what seemed to you as the greatest injustice and tragedy, where you questioned, where is God? Is he still there? Is he powerful? Now you can see, now it's part of a comedy, of a good story that God is bringing to a good conclusion. Now, the new, the theme of the kingdom of God is newness, new transformation of mind, new memories that transform and process what happened before. Yes, God will not wipe out our minds. Yes, we will remember the past. God will wipe out the tears, not the memories. Because Jesus entered into our tragedy, he rose from the death, and his story is changing the tragedy into the comedy. 
Jesus, enter our world, even the most dark and tragic dimensions of our lives. And what we cannot bear, he shouldered on our behalf. If we could not deal with it, he carried it. In his resurrection, he sent his, after his resurrection, he sent the Spirit to transform the mind. And what cannot be done now and here will be done during the millennium. Remember when the tears are wiped out? We're allowed to think, when we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. Yes, yeah, sure, we'll be glad to see Jesus. But you need to you need to put things together. And what about this when I prayed and these bad things happened? And what about this relative of mine who had the same conditions and yet chose a different pathways? How do you process the memories? And because emotional things cannot be sped up, God says, take all the time you need. If it takes you 1,000 years, you have nowhere to hurry. Because the memories need to be healed. So that you can see that what you and I perceived as a tragedy, from God's perspective, is the greatest comedy of all. The best story ever told. And this is the God that we serve. And this is the news, the good news for our lives. Whatever you go through, Remember, in this world, comedy and tragedy always go together. But God will finally turn it in a way that the memories will be healed and we will praise him for eternity and say, you are the best God, we will serve you no matter what because of who you are and how you worked in our lives. Mary has learned that, the disciples have learned that, and it's God's privilege for you and me to be on the same path. God bless you.